Hello everybody, my name is Selenanel, and welcome back to episode 2 of World Building. I was originally planning to have a guest on this part, uh, one of my players from my Crididiot sessions of Pathfinder, but unfortunately he's out of the province for the weekend, so... But up, but but uh, whoops. Uh, big, big news! One, I've probably played a good 30 hours of Sky Factory since the last recording. Bad news! Uh, my computer crashed at one point while I was playing the game and completely destroyed my uh, world building world. So I have I have one that I've been occasionally streaming to Twitch and that's what we're going to use. We're going to turn the volume back up a little bit. So you'll see... A much more flushed out world sort of right off the bat uh, as you can see I have a farm up here where I'm producing wheat and a bunch of mystical architecture I'm soon gonna cut all this out and have it just be mystical architecture uh, save for like a block of wheat uh, I have a chicken farm <laughs> that's been farming chicks pretty good I'm currently working towards uh, an ender pearl chicken which unfortunately needs we need to go to the nether now you might say how are you gonna do that well there's another portal we got a smeltery up and you're working I finally got that right I get the kiln right I have a really shitty monster spotter over there that is just in no way automated I'm making one over there that will also not be uh, automated but it'll be a lot more fun um, my original again I was originally going to ask uh, specifically uh, spliff Spliff McNeely, Master of the Arcade, uh, <laughs> to come along and be on this episode, but he's 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 busy with his brother, so that's fair. Uh, but the next credit session is in two days, and I, I want to talk about plot, because plot's usually pretty important when you're. <sighs> Shit! Ah, oh, damn it! I did the stuff with the blood. All right, we'll fix that. Uh, <laughs> I'm a firm believer that plot is pretty important in, are we done all right? Good. In most things that you're doing, especially if they involve a role playing game, uh, because you got to create a scenario that is going to hook the players, right? You're going to, you, you want your players to want to play the game. And you want to create something that will help their characters grow. I think that's pretty crucial. To being what it's all about. Alright, I think the audio might actually be too loud now. One sec. I had my TV blasting because I was watching a streamer play Cuphead. They were very quiet. Yeah, that's that's way too loud for me. All right, sweet. Uh, Cuphead, by the way, probably the most beautiful game I've ever seen, ever. So plot. When uh when coming up with an idea, you should probably take your players into account uh, as their characters. Um, one thing I personally like doing as a dungeon master, and I think it really helps, is I get a base idea. Where'd I put my cup? Alright. Freaking out. Just thought I lost the whole thing of liquid. Did not. <laughs> Can you tell I have ADHD? Because <laughs> I do. It's a real problem. So, one thing I do is... I, I have very specific campaigns that I like to run. Uh, where I run them in a world that I created and have been working on since I was a very young child. I find it's very easy to create a story in that world that is believable, engaging, with decent NPCs and characters that the players will like and hate. Uh, another reason Spliff would have been great in this group, because he's a, he, he is a character that people love to hate. And he there are many characters in our campaign who he also loves to hate, so. Alright, that was a weird spasm. But it would work. And so what I do is I try to get 
a good idea in mind of what the campaign is going to look like bare bones. I uh, create a plot, I create an antagonist, I create events that are going to entrap the characters with an antagonist, and then I sort of have things go from there. Now to set that up, one thing I do is I ask and normally require, depending on the group I'm working with, uh, my players to not only pre-make a character before the session, if they want my help, I will of course be there in person with them or whatever, I'll assist, but I'll give them a bit of world setting information and say come up with a believable reason why this. You don't need a completely full backstory because again I, I often play with players who it's their first time playing or it's their first character or they've never used this system before. They've probably never played the setting before since it's usually one that I've made. Though I do often use the same setting uh, because I find it a lot of fun to have a built world where whenever I'm playing a game later I can always include characters from my previous campaigns and just sort of have them flow naturally and become part of the world. Where did I put those cactus? Uh, one thing for that, it, one thing that could possibly be a fine example of that is that one of our players owns a tavern called the Ropes End. That's not Cactus. And I personally think... Are they down here? It would be really cool if later on I'm just running a campaign with people, I could reference that location as a place where these characters from the past hundreds of years ago these adventurers made their home. It was the base for this legendary group of adventurers. That's some cool shit. Fourth edition dabbles on that a little bit where when your characters reach max level, basically they retire and do just that. They become immortals in the world through legend or actual immortality, depending on what route you wanted to go. But it, it was this idea that once your character sort of reach the end, that that's it for them for a very important reason. So that they can pass on what they've done, what they've gained, what knowledge they have to the next set of adventurers. Which, if you have a good team that still wants to play together after the story's over, could be their characters. And I, I like the idea of that. I like building a consistent world around my characters. Don't get me wrong, I've built the world myself, but and they're, they're adding to it. They're coloring the world that I've created, if that makes sense. And I think that's a pretty fun system. So, plot, <laughs> because that's what I was originally supposed to talk about. I like to start off fairly strong. Create... A little bit of tension. Did I put all my arrows away? <sighs> Create a bit of tension. Okay, this is crazy. Sorry. The whole thing just started to freak right the frack out on me there. And I really didn't like it or appreciate it. I need to figure out where I put all my arrows. I'm sure I just looked at them since I just went through all of my chests. Um, one of my favorite campaigns that I run is one called uh, the. Si I ran out of fuel. still doing these like preschool level fuck ups and it's really annoying so <laughs> where's my other jetpack oh there it is thank god so the sands of calamere to uh stop feeling extremely absolutely livid 
which I assure you I do, is a campaign in which the characters and players, of course, uh, when I have them make their characters, one of the rules is they are going to a specific place. The characters don't need to know each other, though if they want to, that's totally fine. They can even be related if they want. That's actually a really cool sort of thing to mix in. Uh, but they are c arriving in this continent with the intent of going to its capital. They've spent the majority of their money, or at least the last money of the money that they have, get in here and what and, and why basically they have to come up with a reason why and if they i mean i'll give them of course setting information and i'll help any way i can with that to assist them create a believable backstory and i'll help and guide them through it if need be because i mean why wouldn't i that would be a pretty dickish thing to do it already it gives me an idea of how they want to play their characters and it'll let me color the NPCs they meet later based on sort of what their expectations are uh, the last time I read the sands of Calamere we had a dwarf wizard whose goal was to reach the capital of this continent to witness what bizarre and strange foreign magic they have totally totally believable that is a pretty darn cool story, right? It's like, well, I'm a fledgling wizard, because it's level one, you know? I, I just, I want to see another part of the world. I want to see what type of magic the dwarves there have created. He was also a crafting character. He wanted to see if he could learn new crafting things there to become better at his trade. Great. I, I already have a firm understanding in my mind how this character is going to exist in a world. Uh, another character was a Kitsune, a fox folk. Um, and in our setting, uh, the Kitsune uh, worship their ancestors. They keep little models of fallen family members in the sort of pandorama that they perform their daily worship and rites to. Which is really cool. And basically, the plot behind that was he had a family member who had died recently, and one of their family members lived way far out of the way. Uh, an uncle lived in the capital of this desert city, a continent away. Unlike the rest of the family, who keeps it pretty close to home. And he had no idea that his beloved relative had passed away. So, his whole personal mission was to take the item there so that his uh, uncle's sort of memorial position would be correct. That's a, that's a fantastic thing. And I helped, of course. I, I provided information about the Katsune religion and how they treat their family and whatnot. And he just sort of ran with it. And I think that's a really good basis. Uh, let me think, who else did we have in that particular session we also had a birdman an avx magus uh who wanted to see the capital because his people used to hold the capital they used to rule over the desert uh when they were displaced by humans a few hundred years ago in a pretty brutal war uh and he had just never seen the homeland of his people and wanted to see it also an amazing story already you build in a character who probably has a bit of a chip on their shoulder towards ordinary humans who fill up the majority of the world of course being like one of the highest populated races in the setting and it just it works it's such a good little story uh another character was playing a drow pirate uh who basically wanted to try setting off on their own they wanted to go inland. They wanted to explore an area that they've never explored before. The, la the land. And that was also a great story. And now you're like, alright, so you've presented a reason with why they're all going to the same place. <coughs> but how do you make them get there? Oh, that's going to blow up. Nope. Okay. <coughs> 
Sorry, I have a bit of a cough. Uh, it permeates my entire existence, and I hate having it. And if I was quicker on the mute button, it wouldn't... You're just gonna murder me, skeleton, because you're better than I am. Nope. Alright. Fuck you. He fell off the edge. So, at that point, you're like, alright, sweet. So you have the story sort of thought out. You have all these characters. You probably have an overarching plot plan, which I do. Now, here's the question. How do you make those characters give a shit about each other? Because that's one of the important things about a party. They're supposed to either grow to have an amenity for one another, which could be a fun way to end a campaign where... Uh, a break in morals or a difference in opinion leads to a fight between the party members because it happens people who work together once because of circumstance might grow to genuinely hate one another and if there are conflicting alignments maybe someone does something wrong maybe someone commits a murder uh, that the party just can't tolerate and they get into a huge fight over it that can be a really interesting way to end a campaign it's probably not how I would choose to end a campaign, personally, but if the players get there naturally, who am I to say that it's wrong? It's their, it's their goddamn game, right? Uh, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, I, I, I very much believe that a dungeon master, a game master, is just a vessel for his players to experience a whole new set of experiences. In a setting where there is an understanding character that sort of just exists, but doesn't hinder. Now, does that mean I will let them get away with everything? Probably not. If they try to do something that flat out would in some way be illogical against the mechanics of the game, sure, I have to step forward because rules matter. This, this is just the way it is. There are, there are rules. You try to break the rules of the game, just, you don't, you don't do it. Alright, so, uh, just to talk about the game for a second, we just made a cactus green chicken egg. We're gonna go make a cactus chicken. Sweet. Uh, cause we need that cactus chicken to s screw a yellow chicken, which I think is right there. No, that's a sand chicken. Yellow chicken? Nope, sand chicken. I better not have gotten rid of my yellow chicken. We we need him to reproduce with a chicken of a particular... How do we have two snow chickens? These things are just breeding on their own now, and that's infuriating to me. Uh-oh. I see what might have happened to him. Okay. Fence in the Cajun, guys. We are, uh... We are not. Oh, wait. Is that our yellow chicken? I think that is our yellow chicken. Because I think I just made a gold chicken. Okay, hold up. My, my panic is being alleviated. Yellow chicken? Yep, alright, sweet. Okay, so, as I was saying, uh, the, the Sands of Calamere. So, the goal is to try to make the characters become a amiable with one another, or at least enjoy the idea of traveling together. Now, of course, if you're playing with a group of players who are all friends, this, this could be hard, because they're just going to go into it assuming that the characters already like each other, right? It, it is it is very hard to role play, especially in a situation where you're sitting down with a bunch of your friends on your day off to play a game together, and one of them starts, you know, acting, you know, like, what's the word? Confrontational with each other. And, and, but no, it's, it's the fact that the characters don't know each other. Um, the group I play with has a bit of a hard time with that. Sometimes they just sort of feel like, just because they're together, sometimes it works. At least it felt that way with the first session that we did, where we did a 5e campaign. Uh, I will say they've 
done amazing in Pathfinder, especially Spliff and Griff. They've done a really good job of going out of their way to give the other members of the party, at certain times, reason to trust and distrust them. And I believe that a lot of the members of that group, the players, the characters themselves, are growing to a brotherhood, which is pretty cool. So, Calamere, how do you how do how do you achieve that? How do you make that work and generate a plot that allows you to have a sort of big overarching quest that the characters can strive to, while at the still time giving them agency? Uh, with Calamere, I make it so that the players are broke. Basically, they're all from another continent or at least arriving there from another continent, if they wanted their backstory to be from the uh, desert, uh, which has a name, but there's no point telling it. And I'll probably do a, set, a video at some point where I'm just discussing the world and the places of the world if people want. Yes, no, leave a comment down below. Tell me if that's something cool that you'd like to listen to. And I would totally do that because... Oh, shit. Fuck. <sighs> All right. I'm very upset. I thought we still had more lead. Oh, never mind. We have gold. Okay. Whew. My heart. So for Calamere, I like to make the players broke. Now, is that always cool? Especially where some players focus on crafting. They want there to be money that they have access to early on so they can start making scrolls or potions. Yeah, it's kind of a dick move, but just make sure the players end up getting money. What can I say? I mean, it's not that hard to reward your players monetarily, <laughs> though the, the crit idiots might uh, be upset to hear me say that, because anytime they get money, one of them dies, which is totally not my fault. They just keep getting killed the second they get money. It's like a curse. So, <laughs> I do that because... Normally, it's a it's a bit of a stereotype that the players need to get to a place, find a caravan going to the place, and offer yourself as muscle, right? <laughs> it, it's it's a player cliche to go into the tavern and walk up to the barkeep and go, "Hey, do you know anyone going out to this place who could use some extra muscle?" And the players just sort of get hired on as a guard. Uh, for the caravan, which will inevitably become under attack, because anytime there's a lot of traveling in Dungeons and Dragons, you break that up with a few comments and role play scenes. I hate that cliche. That is almost as bad as meeting for the first time at a tavern, or old friends meeting in a tavern to start their adventure after having lived apart for a few years or some shit. They they went out to trade on their own with the promise to come back and become adventurers. That, it, it works. I mean, Dragon Age did it. I mean, it's a cliche because it works. I, I understand that mentality. It doesn't mean I want it in my game all that often. I'm a fan of cliches, especially if I'm introducing new players to the game. Because cliches are easy, they understand cliches. I also like to mix in modern pop references, or at least some of my modern pop references. <laughs> they know what I'm talking about from our 5e campaign. To, 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 to just alleviate, because it's kind of a dick move to bring up a thing that the people listening might have no idea about. Um, in a, a group of players contacted me. Or well, they posted an ad, basically, in a Facebook group. Saying, hey, me and a bunch of friends used to play or try to play Dungeons and Dragons when we were like in middle school. And we wanted to try playing again and we were wondering if someone could run the game. And I recognized the name as being someone who graduated with me. It, I was pretty sure still lived in the town because his name's plastered all over a freaking neon billboard. Take that, Ibarra. <laughs> have, have some spotlight on you, old man. So I uh, I contacted him. I was like, hey, man, I'll, I'll totally run something for you. What were you thinking? He was like, well, we were thinking 5th edition because, you know, it just came out recently and the rule books are fairly inexpensive. So I volunteered to run 5th edition, having not really enjoyed what I've played of 5th edition, but I'll play any system as long as there's players for it and I have access to it. It's kind of my, it's kind of my thing. 
I have a really hard time saying no to players, which is probably why we ended up with a group of 10 players. Now you might say already that's insane. Yes, yes it is. But again, a lot of them had never played a role-playing game before, ever. And the few that had, had played sort of brokenly when they were much younger. So what do you do, right? What, what do you do in a situation like that to get people hooked? You turn to things they know. So in my case, humor. I was like, all right, well, let's make the first session pretty funny. Let's work in a lot of drama, and, but, but also throw in a bunch of random stuff. Let's get a quest going. And then I thought, well, why don't I make like the names themed around musicians, like musical artists? So there was a character named Gnarls who had a dog named Barkley. He had a son named CeeLo and a daughter named Pink. And they met uh, a marshal named Mathers and a man known as Mac of the Moor who was born on a swamp. <laughs> right? So it was just like little things. L little things to sort of hook them. Just to sort of like, hey, it's it's D and D, it's cool, it's dirty, but you know, hey, we got jokes. We got jokes. But uh, that's that's one way I like to work in new players. It's just a little bit of prep work. I, I don't even remember how I got on this tangent. I'm, I'm sorry that you ever thought to listen to a grown man who has like an extremely hard case of ADHD. So, Calamir, why do I make the players poor? Because you would originally think that the idea is like, oh, but they're going to find a caravan going to the place and sell themselves on a muscle. And then the cliche, that's that's how I got on all that tangential stuff. But then, I, I don't like that cliche. As I've said, when I brought up the cliche, good, good going, Sil, keep bringing it up. So, how do I circumvent that? Well, I make it so that they're arriving at this oasis, this coastal city... Uh, called Razmaran, uh, at like the first week of summer. So the desert is about to be at the hottest it's going to be all year. And while magic exists, and there are several great magical comforts in this world, including things that help resist and ignore the elements, people still don't travel across a desert of black sand during the dead of summer. They just don't. They take the coast. <laughs> they, they get to the nearest city possible and then wait there for things to cool down. Or hire magical transportation, which of course... Shit, I broke that. Damn it, I hate left-clicking. Which of course the players couldn't do, because they're broke. They used all their money just to get to the continent. They can't be affording to teleport themselves all over it. So what I'm what I'm doing when I do that in that specific scenario is I'm reducing the player's options. Which isn't something you're supposed to do in a role playing game, right? Because it's it's all about the players having options. They do. They could do it alone or they could go with the one caravan that's willing to make the trip. Right? Because again, the first session of any campaign is where you gotta build plot. But it, it, more important than building just the plot, you have to build a relationship between the characters that works. Or at least one that is serviceable. So how do how, how do I do that with Calamir? Well, I break the cliche. The players show up, they meet a halfling whose name I stole from a David Eddings book. Uh, because I've always loved that name. And Silk is one of my favorite characters from the Belgarian and the Malorian. Uh, and I love Ambar of Kotu. It's his. It's my favorite one of his uh, personalities that he plays. So they meet a halfling by the name of Ambar, a young man, very young, just in his early twenties, whose family inherited a rather powerful bit of land in a place known in the world for supernatural monstrosities and the undead and plagues basically this world's version of, like a concentrated sort of Ravenloft almost not quite there's no haunting mist that controls everything and there aren't you know strahd but it's it's a set of island an archipelago 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 I don't know is, is, is a string of islands 
where bad stuff tends to happen. And basically, a fortress, a massive castle that was in control of a lich, by a lich, uh, was destroyed, and it was discovered that the deed to the land was actually owed to his family, who had abandoned the castle because of the lich. Uh, and they discovered uh, a set of mushrooms down beneath the catacombs where the lich had been performing his dastardly evil deeds that basically make a delicious, savory spice, like an umani spice that is perfection when ground and dried. So, you already have a character who, one, is presented with theoretically having a lot of money. The spice trade is pretty lucrative. And that comes to the next part. If you have a character who's very money lucrative, who's about to leave within a day to cross a desert, don't you think he'd already have muscle? And that's when I introduce another character, uh, an AVX fighter by the name of Brazen, who was a prisoner of war a good few odd decades ago, who was saved by Ambar's father uh, long before they ever retook their land. And Ambar, uh, because of the relationship with his father, is sort of stuck working with this other man, which is fine. They're, they get along amiably. They, they like each other. But this is a man with a very highly skilled group of soldiers that... <laughs> Where'd my other jetpack go? What the fuck? Hold up, sorry guys. Sorry for swearing too. I, I'm just literally blowing my own mind with how stupid I am. Did that chicken already do the thing? Yeah, it hatched. Where is it? I noticed that I asked that while looking at a field of green. Where's the green chicken? All right, hold up. I really need to find that jetpack just so I know where it is. So, Brazen and his mercenary troop are already hired by Amber. Whether or not Amber wants it or not, or would prefer the cheaper players, he's kind of stuck with what he has. Oh, there you are, you little cutie. Boop, boop, boop. Time to get in. Fed all up. And Brazen isn't about to just take the insult that, you know, his people can't handle the job. So, this his person, who is a son of a colleague of his, wants to hire more help. To Brazen, that's a bit of an insult. Which, of course, you know... Uh, da -da 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 -da. Amber apologizes for and just states why he felt that would be a good idea. And Brazen accepts the apology, but is on wavering. Because he's supposed to be. He's an aged veteran who's got a group of highly skilled soldiers who he trained himself to fight. Suddenly, these group of randoms who have never fought together before in their life, theoretically, depending on how your group ends up making themselves. Right? Like, why is he going to trust them on the same level that he would trust people that he's personally trained and fought many battles with? So already, that, that cliche gets thrown out of the window by the caravan not needing the players. Players like to get away with things because they feel the NPCs need them. Way, way more often than not, that is what a player is thinking. Even in my games where I try to avoid the stereotype, we'll be in the middle of a session, and, or it was actually very recently, we were just finished on a recording, or a session, and one of my players was like, so alright, so uh, how's the rescue mission going? And I went, what rescue mission? 
He's like the blind woman we met along the way. We're rescuing her, right? And her friends. And I went, no. She's an extremely skilled warrior who bested your barbarian in a sparring match. Whose friends are all higher level than she is. And she's just separated from them. And the group had decided because they'd taken some pretty serious statistical damage to assist her in finding her companions so that her companions could heal their wounds because she of course offered the service of her friends but he he's been played remotely because he lives in another city now uh which makes yes listening a little bit hard because you know there's so many distractions when you're not there at the table hell there are so many distractions when you are there at the table it's totally understandable but his instinct was to think, there's this new NPC, we're going to bring this NPC to other NPCs, this is a rescue mission. And it wasn't. But that's how the players think. They, especially players who've played at least one or two campaigns, sort of get the feeling in their head that players are sort of above the norm. And yes, in some settings, players really are. But one thing I like to do in my setting is just sort of ground my players in reality. There are other people out there. This planet is massive. It's many times the size of Earth. You are not the only adventurers. And your adventures, while important to you, and possibly the entire world without the world knowing it, might not be as... Whoa, that guy hit me hard might not be as important as the players like to think of themselves. Especially uh, characters who like to uh, bark more than they bite. The ones who, you know, my legend spans across several continents and I am the leader of this great group of adventurers. Have you not heard my name? <laughs> Spliff, <laughs> I'm looking at you, buddy. <laughs> But they, they, they tend to, as at a default, believe they are just the bee's knees. And that's cool, they could be. But I really like grounding my players in the idea that even if what they're doing is very important, even if they've grown very strongly, there are people who are stronger than they are. And there isn't going to be a time when they are quote-unquote needed. And that they need to come up with a way to deal with those situations. So, to discuss how this works in Calamere, they are faced with a problem. They're not needed by the group they're trying to get hired by. They have a skilled mercenary and an entire troop of his trained soldiers. Why would they hire a bunch of ramshackle people? They won't. Money is tight. Money exists. It sucks. Trust me, I know it sucks. But it exists. It is, it is a sad fact. And even Ambar, who is getting into the spice trade, does not have infinite money. Uh, we're actually going to go make some prosperity shards. Because we need those to make more seeds. So, how do I resolve this? How does the plot move forward? Simple. You give the players the chance. Brazen will begrudgingly admit that he doesn't mind the players coming with them. Assuming they can pay their own way. And because his, the person in control of his little group... Uh, Ambar is so adamant about having you all along, he'll even waive the fee for protecting them as well. But they have to supply the money for their own food and water, which comes out to roughly 100 gold. Now that's pretty damn high when you consider how cheap food is in most role-playing settings. But they are doing like a multi-month trek through a desert. Food and water and protective gear are expensive. If the cargo is going to need to you bring so many extra people with them, it's a really good excuse to say they're going to need to buy an entire other wagon of set of camels. So at that point, you're looking at... God, what was I literally just about to do with this game? 
Oh, I remember. Okay, yep, we're good. All right, my brain came back. So it's just really interesting to put the players in a position where now all of a sudden they have a day to make 100 gold each. And what does that make the players do? It's going to probably make most of the players work together. They're going to leave that inn or bar knowing that they have a better day to raise a bunch of money or else they're just not going to be able to complete their quest or they're going to have to risk doing it themselves in the desert, which would be terrible, but a fun campaign until they all died, which could also be fun. Death, death is not the end. Death is merely an interesting blip in the story. So suddenly you, you get the idea going in their head that they have to work together. They don't need to. If you have a very skilled bard who wants to dedicate the entire day to performing for an audience or trying to get an audience with the king to see if they can perform some sort of shenanigans to make the money, sure, let that player be a lone wolf. Because it means they're going to be missing out on a lot of the role playing and flavor, but if it's what they think their character would do, that's fine. So while this is happening, what I like to do is have the player with the lowest intelligence get targeted. Uh, because they're being watched. Dun, 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 the plot! And basically, they are communicated with by a, a, a figure who's hooded, who they can't quite make out. Though, of course, allow them to roll to see if they notice anything different. Which is awesome, because, you know, it's just going to show that, you know, there's things going on that the players don't understand or know about. What is that? Ancient spores. And it basically gives a pl one of the players... Where did I put that other sand? There was a sand in there, right? I only took one out. Oh, there's my other jetpack, by the way. It's just charged, sitting in there. That's fine. I am so actually confused. Like, what the shit just happened? There's a singular piece of sand. Alright. So now one player is sort of aware that there's a big bad going on. Or something ulterior happening. Which of course the other players will now know about, but not have any way in game to show that they know. Which leads to all sorts of interesting conversations when, you know, they all arrive with whatever pittance of money they've managed to raise. And one of them just goes, here, I managed to raise enough money for everybody. Which is just really funny. And again, it sets the tone for something later. Now, how do I get this involved with a bigger plot? Well, I've already set up a pretty huge plot point right there. But it's really only got one person involved, and there's a good chance they won't even remember the encounter if they roll a pretty low, uh, a pretty average, we'll say, for a first-level character. I like to make it not impossible, but difficult to uh, actually end up remembering that whole interaction, because it's much more fun if the character does it, in my opinion. So what happens then is they set off on this journey together, a group of them. Still never really fought battles together or done anything together, for the most part. But that changes, because again, it's a, it's a traveling distance and random encounters and shenanigans. So what that means is that things end up going wrong. They end up getting into fights. And you present them with all sorts of moral decisions. You just fought off a group of desert worms. Uh, when one of the party members or one of the NPCs, uh, assuming the party members were unable to hear it. Oh, I don't, just, I don't have enough for that. Okay. Uh, heard the crying of a creature off in the distance. And you go to investigate, assuming they do. If not, have one of the NPCs do it. 
and they discover that the creature's mother is nearby and wounded. And that's why these normally pretty docile creatures who just scavenge in the wild were attacking fully armed travelers heading through on their own. So, suddenly you have this idea that, well, shit, we just killed something that was just panicking because its mother is dying. Shit. Already, some of the players are going to feel bad. They might. Not all of them. Not every gr player group is the same, of course. You might find players who just don't give a shit. But they might give a shit. And that's, that's the good stuff. That's what you want. You want players giving a shit. So, what happens from that? Well, the players have a decision to make. Are they going to put the poor creature down? You could also point out that there are some dead bodies nearby. Why? Oh, loot. That's going to encourage the greedy players to get their hands involved. Or their hands dirty. Even if they don't really want to for the sake of, you know, they don't want to just butcher a helpless creature that's dying. You can, you can, it's it's a way to help build the character's narrative with one another. Which works. It just does. You provide them with a moral dilemma that isn't too serious for the sake of the party. But has implications beyond that. And you just, you run with it. That's 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 sort of how you have to build a party, but the the whole point of this discussion is plot, and I've sort of kept getting off on tangents, and I realize that, and I'm very sorry, that like I keep saying, all right, let's let's get to the plot, and then I just completely look the other direction from the plot. I understand that I'm doing it, and I wish that I couldn't, but you know, I'm sorry. Also, what how long is this going? Because we really need to not make this too too long. 46 minutes. Alright, we gotta wrap this up. So during their adventures, the players are fighting together, they're learning more about each other, they're role-playing with each other, but they're also role-playing with the NPCs. You want to get them hooked on crucial NPCs as well. You definitely want to get them hooked on Brazen. You want to get them hooked on Ambar. Heck, if you really want to put the effort and time into it, get them hooked on the other NPCs as well. Why not? Get them hooked on individual members of Brazen's team. Maybe even a romantic involvement. Nothing creates drama faster than a romance, especially if you're in a dangerous, action-filled scenario where someone could easily die. Especially an NPC who's designed to be a little bit stronger than them at first level, but start losing away to the players as they get stronger. So, how do I work the plot? And where do I get them hooked? Simple. You, you do a whole bunch of cool things. You introduce cool NPCs. You do all of this work. And then you get the player set up so that they meet new people. Who, of course, are going to change their viewpoint. And then you put them in a, in a situation where they meet a cool NPC, uh, <coughs> but they discover a plot, a cult, a twist, something. In the case of Calamere, it's a cult. And have them try and stop the cult. They've, they've, the cult has basically taken captive uh, an NPC who they enjoy, or at least an NPC who is relevant to them. And they have to stop it. They have to figure out the evil and prevent it from happening. Have them fail. They're not necessarily like you are doomed to fail. But more like the the end of this will probably be this. Can the players prevent it? Absolutely. Is it difficult? Oh god, yes. And how is that you create a bigger narrative by giving them an enemy who they don't beat immediately? Sure, a, a minion or a bad guy with a special cloak running away is annoying, but it doesn't build a nemesis. And that's one thing I really like doing in my settings, bi building an antagonist who works. 
And I think it's pretty effective for pulling out a plot. And that's one of the things I like to do a lot. Uh, I wanted to keep this video at around 45 minutes, and I ended up going like 55. Um, so I really rambled a lot, and I'm sorry. So th that's, that's just how I, as a DM, like to handle my plots. I try to introduce cliches occasionally, or introduce a cliche specifically to break it. Uh, force the characters to work together, at least to the point where they can grow to understand one another. I'm not forcing them to like one another, I'm just saying they need to spend time with one another. And then introduce uh, a nemesis who they can rally behind. And that's that's a pretty simple plot. And not every setting I run has that. Not every campaign. But it's a pretty good start for a pretty simple session. Or a campaign that could go on for a really long time. If the players play their cards right. Survive and form a strong bond with one another. Uh, that's going to be me. Oh yeah, more prosperity sheds. I hope people found this informative. Hopefully for the next session of world building where it's actually me talking tabletop, uh, I'll have one of my players here to do sort of a, an, an interview, sort of. If you have any questions or comments or anything you'd like me to discuss and are still listening to this video, leave the comment down below and I'll either get back to you in the comments or in a future video. Thank you. And again, please share the video with your friends. Uh, if you enjoy it, pass it along i don't care about likes comments are cool because i love getting them but the most important thing is just sharing the video with people who you think might like it thank you have a great day